Oh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are in an improper integral state of mind today. We're going to introduce a, a certainly what I consider a mind-blowing topic. Of all the topics that we cover this year, this is the one that is, seems to, to be the most intriguing one to think about and try to ponder. Specifically, we're, because we're going to try to measure the area of an unbounded region, a, be, uh, a, a particular region that has um, what, what I call kind of a leak um, in it, um, and you, you would naturally suspect that if the region is unbounded and it extends infinitely, then the area must also be infinite. And we're going to look at some examples today where we actually have a finite amount of area within an unbounded region, which is certainly mind blowing. So, anyway, let me first pose this graph right here. Let's talk about 1 over x, the graph of 1 over x. It's asymptotic to both axes here. And uh, maybe we wanted to try to integrate that function from, eh, let's put a 1 down there, from 1 to infinity. It's a little bit of a mess here. And what you notice here is if, let's say that's where 1 is, and infinity extends all the way here, that this region is what I call an unbounded region because this graph over here never actually hits the x-axis. And so as we go towards infinity, we have an unbounded region. Uh, the other idea here is maybe we could take a look at the same graph, 1 over x again. But maybe our integral goes from, say, 0 to 1 this time. Now what's happening again because, let's say there's maybe that's where 1 is. Uh, because the graph goes infinitely high without touching the y-axis again, we, we have an unbounded region at the top of that. And, and we're going to try to measure the area of both of those regions today and see if we can come up with some kind of finite number, perhaps. My goal here in the beginning of the lesson is to focus a lot on the, the whole theory of it, and then we'll gradually get ourselves into four examples. Um, but as far as the, the, the theory goes, and we're still posing the same question, how could you possibly have a finite amount of area if you are integrating all the way towards infinity or something? I want you to imagine that you're holding a, a regular sheet of paper, 8.5 by 11, and you simply took that sheet of paper, you ripped it in half, you kept what's in your left hand, but you took what's in your right hand and you threw it in some container that's uh, next to you. You then took the sheet of paper that was in your left hand and you ripped that in half and repeated the same process. You kept what's in your left hand, but you took what's in your right hand and you threw it in this container that's next to you. And, and suppose that we repeated this process over and over and over and over again. And maybe we'll let n equal the number of rips that we've performed. We just continuously keep ripping the paper in half, in half, in half. This would be difficult to do after maybe just you know five or six rips because now what I have left is very small, but theoretically we could continue to rip it in half. Um, and then maybe we'll let P equal the amount of paper that we have in our, that we've discarded or thrown in the container that's sitting next to us. Okay, and the question becomes, as N approaches infinity, Let's say we've sat there and we've ripped this piece of paper in half continuously maybe a hundred times and then uh, then a thousand times and then ten thousand times, so on and so on. What is P approaching? Okay, that is our question. How much paper have you discarded in this container that's sitting next to you? Okay, uh, I hope that you'd agree that no matter how many times we've ripped the paper, it's impossible to have more than one sheet of paper discarded in the container because we, we certainly, we just started with one piece of paper. We're ripping that in half continuously and certainly we've probably discarded quite a bit in the container but not never more than one sheet of paper. So I could make the argument that P is approaching, you know, one complete sheet of paper. Okay, never more than that. So there's an example, uh, theoretically, of how you, you could, you'd always have something in your left hand no matter how small it got, you'd always be able to rip it in half, but yet you've never ripped more than one complete piece of paper. Okay, a another theoretical example here is a, a fractal known as a sphere flake. Okay, this is, uh, these are a couple of pictures I pulled off the web, very beautiful pictures. Basically, the idea of a sphere flake, and maybe this one over here does a better job, you have one central sphere in kind of this lime green color whose radius is one. Okay, and then you attach nine spheres around it who have a radius equal to one-third. And then on to each of those, 
nine pink ones, you then attach nine more spheres that have a radius of one ninth, and onto each of those purple spheres you attach um, little rascals that have a radius of 127th and you continue this process on forever and forever and forever and you start to develop an image that looks like this rascal right here. What we're going to later prove before the year's over is we're going to prove that the sum of the surface area of every sphere is an infinite number Okay, which probably doesn't bother you too much. You say, yeah, okay, you know, there's an infinite number of spheres, although they do get quite small, and that if I added the surface area of each one of those together, yeah, the sum would become infinite. However, here's where we're going to blow your mind. We're going to prove that the sum of the volume of each sphere, we, we calculate the volume of each one and we add it all together, we're going to prove that their sum is a finite number. Okay, that's where things start to get real crazy, and, and that's something we're going to tackle before the year's over. Now, there are two primary types of improper integrals, and, and that's, we're going to split this into a two-day lesson. Um, the first type is where we have an endpoint um, on your integral of infinity or negative infinity. Okay, so when you look at your integral, either the, the bottom bound or the top bound that I call the endpoints, one of them is going to be... Um, infinity in nature okay see back in back when we first started doing definite integrals there was basically two prerequisites and we didn't make a big deal out of either one of them because they were so basic and elementary but we basically our first prerequisite was that the interval a to b had to be a finite interval okay and then the function itself had to be completely and thoroughly continuous within the interval a to b and that's basically what an improper integral is is it either violates the first condition or the second condition or perhaps even both of them I guess if it got really crazy okay but as far as today's lesson we're gonna focus on just uh, basically violating that first condition right here okay um, the first example we might see is an integral that starts at a which is a finite number but goes all the way to infinity okay and the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna rewrite that in terms of a limit okay we're gonna say the limit as b approaches infinity integral from a to b f of x. We're then going to find the antiderivative of f and then we'll evaluate that derivative with the bounds of b and a, uh, specifically evaluating the limit as b approaches infinity. The second example we might see is the integral may start at negative infinity and go up to b. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite that in terms of a limit. We'll say that the limit as a approaches negative infinity integral from a to b f of x dx same thing we'll find the antiderivative plug the bounds in and then evaluate the limit and then the third case uh, the last example we're going to do today pertains to this is what if the integral wants to go from negative infinity to positive infinity what we're going to then do is we're going to express this we're actually going to split it um, at some arbitrary point we'll say negative infinity to c Okay, C could be any finite number that falls between negative infinity and infinity. I usually pick zero because it's the most convenient. Plus the integral from C to infinity f of x dx. And then we would go ahead and use the, past, the last two steps to rewrite this guy in terms of A and then to rewrite this one in terms of B and we'd evaluate both of them. Interesting note here, both of those integrals have to end up coming to a finite number or what we like to say is con convergent in order for it, um, they let me start over. Both of them have to converge in order for the sum of the two of them to converge, okay? So just make a note that both have to converge. If you got one to converge but the other to diverge, you would then have a divergent answer. Diverge basically means we end up with infinity for an answer. Converge means we end up with a finite answer. Um, we'll talk more about that as we go. One last note before we move on. I indicated that there was actually basically two types of improper integrals. The second type is where we might have finite endpoints, but then what's going to happen is that f of x happens to be discontinuous at some point within the interval a to b. Um, for instance, uh, maybe I'm thinking of the graph 1 over x squared that looks like this, and it's asymptotic right there at x equals 0, and maybe we want to integrate from negative 1 to 2 of 1 over x squared. Both the bounds are finite numbers, but what happens is you have an infinite dis uh, discontinuity on the interior of those bounds, and that's the type of improper integral we'll look at in our next lesson for tomorrow.
Okay, it's finally time for us to put all this theory into practice, and I want to evaluate the integral that goes from 1 to infinity of dx over x, or in other words, 1 over x times dx. I think it's always valuable to be able to try to visualize the region that we're trying to find the area of. Okay, we know what 1 over x looks like. It also has a mirror image in the third quadrant, but that doesn't pertain to these, this particular integral. And so we're starting at 1, and we're calculating all the area all the way towards infinity here. So we have an unbounded region. Our first goal is to rewrite this in terms of a limit. The limit as b approaches infinity, integral from 1 to b, dx over x. Now, we're going to have to be very, very careful with our notation, okay? Resist that urge to get a little lazy. We need to continue to write that limit each time. The antiderivative, uh, this is basically du over u, except it's x, dx over x. So the antiderivative is the natural log of x. I'm not going to worry about the absolute values because I know uh, my interval from 1 to b contains all positive numbers. Uh, the first fundamental theorem then says we are allowed to plug the upper bound in first, then the lower bound in second. Okay, and here's where we really got to bear down and focus. The natural log of infinity. What does that, what's happening to the natural log function as b gets really, really huge? Well, just picture that graph that you've drawn a million times on your bite-sized quiz. Would you agree that this graph grows without bound, okay? Even though it's not growing very fast, this curve is getting higher and higher. So as the x values get bigger, the y values also get bigger. So I'm gonna say that the natural log of b is infinity, and that the natural log of one is zero. Infinity minus zero is infinity, and therefore, since it's an infinite amount of area, we say that this integral diverges. That's the conclusion we want to draw. We're going to say that the integral diverges. There's an infinite amount of area within that unbounded region. All right, our second example is going to come off uh, first glance, very similar. Integral from 0 to infinity of the function e to the negative x dx. Uh, I want to try to draw a sketch to visualize what we're tackling here. We have a decreasing exponential function that swoops in like this. Maybe we'll switch pen colors just to make it a little more exciting. Our integral starts at x equals 0 and goes all the way to infinity. And technically, there is always a little sliver of a gap right there because the curve is asymptotic to the x-axis and never touches it. So again, we have an unbounded region, thus creating an improper integral. Uh, first things first, good notation. We want to rewrite this integral in terms of a limit. Limit as b approaches infinity. Integral from 0 to b, e to the negative x dx. Okay, the antiderivative, you, technically we're doing a little bit of a u sub without actually writing it out and showing all the steps. I got negative e to the negative x was the antiderivative, bounds of 0 and b. Next step, we're going to use our first fundamental theorem to plug those bounds in. So we have negative e to the negative b minus negative e to the negative 0. Okay. It's getting a little messy here. We've got a lot of minus signs bouncing around. Um, I'm going to get just uh, try to clean this up just a little bit. I'm actually going to put this term first. Because of those two negatives, we've created a positive sign. E to the 0 is simply 1 minus, okay, and e to the negative b. I'm going to rewrite that as 1 over e to the positive b, okay? Always helps to rewrite your term with positive exponents when you evaluate these limits. And what you'll notice is that e to the b is an astronomically huge number. One divided by a huge, huge number will always give you zero. So I'm going to say that, of course, one stays a one, and then this term here becomes zero, and one minus zero is one. Therefore, this integral that we started with is a convergent integral or would say that it converges, okay? So we just right there, my mind is blown. I've got an unbounded region, okay? But it converges to a finite amount of area. And basically what we're saying mathematically is that this graph descends just fast enough 
or in other words, it approaches the x-axis fast enough that the space in here becomes basically irrelevant. Um, you're still adding a little bit of positive area, but it's so small and so inconsequential that you do approach a finite number, very similar to our paper ripping argument that we made earlier. Well, the next integral is kind of an exciting one, and I want to kind of, I'm kind of, unfortunately, I'm going to give away the antiderivative here a little bit, but I just want to refresh your memory from yesterday. We said that if you're trying to integrate du divided by a squared plus u squared, you end up with what? 1 divided by a arctan of u divided by a plus c, okay? And uh, that's a very, very famous antiderivative that you'll see a lot with these improper integrals. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at one here. We've got the integral from 0 to infinity, the function 1 over x squared plus 1 dx. This function, uh, you'll recognize, has a y-intercept of 1. And it also, because it's small over large, has an asymptote at uh, y equals 0, so the curve kind of bounces like this. We saw this function on a spiral earlier this year, and we tried to inscribe uh, a rectangle underneath that curve that maximized its own area. But anyway, that's a whole different story. Today, we are trying to find the region starting at x equals 0 uh, all the way to infinity, trying to find the area of that unbounded region. So first things first, let's rewrite the uh, integral in terms of a limit. Limit as b approaches infinity. Integral from 0 to b, 1 over x squared plus 1 dx. Now hopefully you'll notice that this integral fits the mold of, whoops, i got to get my pen going here, fits that mold beautifully up here for that generic arctan antiderivative. So we've got the limit as b approaches infinity. Our antiderivative is going to be the arctangent of x from 0 to b. We could then notice this limit comes with me all the way until the very end when I evaluate the, the um, antiderivative in terms of b. Arctangent of b minus the arctangent of 0. Okay. Now here's where, I don't know if you remember earlier in the year on a lot of our bite-sized quizzes, we stressed the ability to sketch that arctan function. And I think right here is where it all pays off. Okay, we know that the arctan graph looks like that. We've got, we've got a nice horizontal asymptote up here. That's at pi over 2. We've got another horizontal asymptote down here. That's at negative pi over 2. So that's going to, being able to visualize this curve is going to help me evaluate these um, particular terms. Let's see, as b approaches infinity, we'll put b way out here, what's the height of the graph approaching? We say the height of the graph is approaching pi over 2. And then the arc tangent of 0 is right here, so we'd say that's just... I <laughs> hope you're having fun following my arrows. And therefore, my final answer is just simply pi over 2. Therefore, because that's a finite number, we'd say that this integral converges Okay, and notice this particular notation stayed with me the entire time until I evaluated the arctangent of b. Once I evaluated that term, said that it was pi over 2, the limit was no longer necessary. Our fourth and final example tonight is by far the wildest bear. Um, not only do my bounds extend uh, from negative infinity to infinity, but the function we're integrating is also the feistiest looking. We're going to say e to the x divided by 1 plus e to the 2x. This is a very feisty function. Uh, graphically, it looks very similar to the last one we did, um, where it kind of arches this way, and then it becomes asymptotic to the x-axis. So again, we have certainly have an unbounded region, and I probably should extend it. And it's um, it's an even function; it would go in the other direction as well. Um, conceptually, uh, as far as our notation goes, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this. We're going to break it at some interior point c, and I'm going to choose zero. So we've got the integral from negative infinity to 0 plus the integral from 0 to positive infinity. And then what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite the first one as the integral from a to 0. Whoops, to 0 up there. Limit as a approaches negative infinity. We'll fill in the rest here this time. Okay. Plus, and then we're going to say the limit as 
B approaches positive infinity, integral from 0 to B, e to the x divided by 1 plus e to the 2x. Now, instead of breaking the integral at 0, I mean, you could have broken at, you know, x equals 5 if you wanted to. You could have gone, you, know, you could have put a 5 up here and a 5 down there, but it's just, that'd be so much messier to handle. The 0 is such a better number to evaluate and plug in. Now, here comes the real fun part. What is the antiderivative of this real obnoxious function? Okay, and uh, I don't I don't have the luxury of having a lot of room here on my screen to to, to work it all out and stuff. But it does fit. Believe it or not, it does fit the arctangent mold. Okay, and I'll try to convince you here shortly. Uh, this right here is simply e to the x being squared. Okay, that's just e to the x being squared. So I could say, what if I let u equal e to the x, then my du would also be e to the x. And by the time I do all my substituting, um, I would have a du up here. This would be my a squared, and then this term here would be my u squared, Okay, assuming that a is equal to 1, which is very convenient. So with all that in mind, um, if, I, if I went too fast and it doesn't make any sense, I'll, I'll try to explain it better in class tomorrow. But um, with all that being said... Uh, the antiderivative is going to be the arc tangent of u, which in this case is e to the x. Isn't that wild? The arc tangent of e to the x. From a to 0 plus the limit as b approaches infinity. Try to squeeze it in here. Same thing over here. We've got the arc tangent of u, which is e to the x, with bounds of 0 to b. Okay. Now... We're going to try to evaluate those integrals. Uh, I'm going to plug this in very, boy, i got a bad feeling that I'm going to run out of room here. Let's try to focus on just this first term here. We'll go arc tangent of, let's see, plug in the upper bound. I get e to the 0, which is simply 1, minus the arc tangent of e to the a power. Okay, now, oh boy e to the a power is like, think of it as e to the negative infinity, which I could rewrite as 1 over e to the positive infinity power, okay? Now, let's clean this, let's clean just this part up. Arctangent of 1 is just pi over 4 minus, now 1 over e to the infinity um, is like 1 over huge, so that equals 0, and the arctangent of 0 is 0, okay? So that's what I'm getting for the first half of this problem. And, and we made a note earlier today that both of these um, pieces have to converge in order for the whole thing to converge. So my first half does converge to pi over 4. And I'm going to switch colors here just to try to clarify. I'm now going to bring this plus sign down. Um, I've got that limit as b approaches infinity. And it says arc tangent of e to the b power minus the arc tangent of, oh, goodness, ran out of room. Anyway, that turns out to be e to the 0 power, which is just a 1. So that's the arc tangent of 1 right there. The arc tangent, now e to the b is huge. If you visualize the graph of arc tangent, um, as the independent variable gets uh, bigger and bigger and bigger, then the dependent variable approaches a height of pi over 2 minus, let's see, the arctangent of 1 is pi over 4. 90 degrees minus 45 degrees is 45 degrees, also known as pi over 4. We've got that big fat plus sign in the middle, and I add those two together, and I'll get a convergent answer of pi over 2. So we've proven in a wild, wild, wild problem that this one does indeed converge. Uh, feel free to replay and watch this one as many times as you need to. And if you need specifically help with this antiderivative right here, then feel free to catch me in class tomorrow and we'll, we'll write it out and we'll take our time doing so. So good luck tomorrow and we'll see you later.